We are in the book of Ezra. I almost said we're in the gospel of, but it's not a gospel. Um, we're in the book of Ezra. Um, as we learned last time, the Lord had stirred the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, who was a Gentile. Okay, he, w- he was not Jewish. He, he was a Gentile. He, and, and, and it lets us know that sometimes people have this mindset that here's God's people and he stirs and works with them and here's his non-people. He don't care. Uh, he just like, you know, brushes them off. Not true, not even close. Often as you go through the scriptures, God stirs the spirits of non-Christians. Uh, God stirs the spirits of those that that he desires to work in and through. And he uses non-Christians. He uses donkeys. Okay, so, so this shows us the depth that our God will go through and to to reach us. Okay, he, he doesn't like, you know, pick the cream of the crop as we may think, or he, he doesn't just pick certain kinds. He will go through anything anyway to reach us and so he's stirred the spirit of king cyrus who was king of the persian empire who conquered the babylonian empire uh, and he stirred him to give him to tell the children of israel and give them permission to return to jerusalem and to rebuild the temple okay they were under the leadership and the rule and the control of cyrus they were servants. They were slaves. They were captives. They did not have the freedom to go wherever they wanted. So God stirred his spirit, and he gave them permission to go. He even, he even gave them permission and encouraged them, go not just to hang out, go build the temple of your God is what he shared with them because Nebuchadnezzar had completely leveled Jerusalem and completely leveled and destroyed the temple. But please take note, as we mentioned, Cyrus did not command them to go because he understood that the people of Israel who were under his authority because they lived in his empire, but he understood that they were not actually his people. Okay, I mean, that's rough for a king to grab a hold of. As he looks out over his empire, it's his empire. It's his kingdom. They're his people. But he realized, as God stirred his spirit, yeah, they're not mine. They do not belong to me. I do not have the right to order them around and to command them around. Now, he had the right to give them the, he had the right and the authority to give them permission. I give you permission to leave my empire and go to where you came from and begin to rebuild there. So he knew that he didn't have the authority to command them. He understood that God had stirred his heart, and he had the authority to give him permission, and that's what he did. He left the authority to stir the hearts of the children of Israel, or to stir the spirits of the children of Israel, into God's hands. I'm not going to make them go. I don't have the right to make them go. So I have the right to give them permission. Go. It's up to you, God. You stir their heart. God used Cyrus to give them permission to go. He didn't give them permission to stir their spirits. God stirs up the spirits of people, not us. God may use us as instruments of permission. He may use us as instruments of wisdom. He may use us as instruments of giving direction. He may use us as instruments of encouragement. But we don't have the authority or the abilities to stir up people's spirit. Only God has that, not us. And, and it's important for us to recognize for a few reasons. One, that we don't get confused as far as who has the authority and power. It's not us. It's him. Secondly, it lets us know he's involved. 
please recognize God is involved in coming after us. God is involved in, in where and what things do. He's not just sitting up on the throne saying, do things. He's involved. He's the one stirring the spirits of people. He's the one giving gifts to people. He's the one that is doing and going before us. We are the ones that are surrendering to that. So God had stirred the spirit of Cyrus, who gave the children of Israel permission to go. And the Lord stirs the spirits of the leaders and the priests to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild the house. Look at Ezra chapter 1. Look at verse 5. It says, Then the heads of the father's house of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all whose spirits God had moved, arose to go up and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Father, it is our desire for you to just stir our spirits, Lord. Father, as we read how you love us the way that you do and how you work in us and through us, Father, uh, Lord, that your work and your grace may be shared with the world. So, Bless us now as we continue to open your word together, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's two things I like to focus on here in, in this, this verse. Uh, the first is what I've already shared in the beginning. The, the Lord is the one who stirs the spirits of people, not us. It says that just as God had stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, we read here that it was God who had moved, which is the same word as stirred up. It is God who had moved or stirred up the spirits of the leaders and the priests and the Levites to go build the house of the Lord. It wasn't themselves. It wasn't the words of Cyrus. It wasn't like, hey, if, if Cyrus is for us, then I'm going. Now, God might have used the words of Cyrus, giving them permission, but make no mistake, it was God. It tells us there in the text it was God who speared up, stirred up their spirits. And do you see the difference, folks, to where, yes, God uses us, but, but it's Him that is doing the stirring. It is Him that is doing the work. Remember when Peter was on his way to the temple, uh, him and John were on his way to the temple, and the lame man was laying there, and he asked for alms, and and, and uh, John, uh, Peter turned to him, and, and uh, let me read it to you so I don't mess up the quote. Uh, uh, Peter turns to him in, in uh, um, Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. It says, and then Peter said, the silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and, and praising God. I would have loved to have seen this guy. I mean, uh, you know, he, he couldn't walk for, I don't know, from birth, or, but he couldn't walk. And all of a sudden he's walking. No, he's leaping, okay? He's jumping up and down. He's running. He just, he can't believe this. And he's praising Peter. No, wait, wait, wait. I think it said, oh, he's praising God. Okay? Who he didn't see. Okay? But it was God that healed him. It was God that did that work in his life. I mean, he knew it. He understood it. I'm sure he thanked Peter, but he gave glory and praise to God who had healed him and risen him from that bed and given him the abilities to go on and to now walk. And look at the reaction of the people. Acts 3, beginning in verse 11. Now, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. And then Peter saw it, and he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look at us, look so intently at us, as though by our own power or godliness 
we made this man walk. As, as this guy's just, he's got his arm around Peter. He's hugging Peter, giving glory to God, pray, you know, excited, praising God, excited that Peter was, was used by the Lord. And then the people are just like, oh my God, did you see what Peter just did? And, and so Peter looks at him and says, why are you looking at us? As if by our own power and godliness, this man was healed. He's telling them, we don't have the power to heal this man. And it's, he's not healed because we're so godly. Okay, we walk so close with God. If you walk close with God, you too can do it. It's not, it has nothing to do with our godliness. It has nothing to do with our power. We can't do this. Peter then points them to Jesus. And he says in Acts 3.16, And his name, the name of Jesus, through faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So he, he said it was, it was in the name of Jesus, this man. Peter says, listen, through the faith that Peter has in the name of Jesus made this man strong, not Peter. And then Peter says that the very faith that he has is through Jesus. Well, how'd you get such faith? I studied hard. I got into the, I learned Greek and Hebrew. I, I read the Bible three times this year. I, he says, the very faith that I have came through Jesus. I didn't even develop the faith. I didn't even make the faith. God gave me the faith. When that man looked at me, I, I heard the voice of God tell me, tell him that you don't have any money, but what you do have, you'll give him. And give him the name of Jesus. Give him the name of Christ. And reach out and lift him up. Can you imagine that? Have John do it. What if he, can't, what if he doesn't stand? What if he starts to stand and falls? What if it doesn't work? What if he looks at me and gives me this weird look like, dude, I can't get up, I'm, I'm lame. What, what if, what? he says, but God, God gave him the faith to say, okay, here goes. I don't have any money, but I do have Jesus inside me. And by his name, I command you to stand. And he lifted him up. And by the name of Jesus, this man was healed. Does God do his work through us? Yes but he does not do his work by our own power or godliness. Please understand that. Okay, because we have these images that, that he only works through the super godly. Cyrus wasn't super godly. I don't believe the donkey was super godly. You know, there's a lot of not very godly people or not even a touch of godliness. God uses and does what God desires to do because he's all-knowing and all-wisdom. He knows what's right and why. Norman Fisher a, of Steadfast uh, Lutherans says that Sunday worship service, services achieve their effect based on the Word and the Spirit, not the pastor. Here's his quote. The thing that makes the worship service work has nothing to do with the man. The man speaks the words and promises of Jesus. The man is merely a vessel, empty and worthless, except for the words given him by the gospel. This is what I want us to grab a hold of, again, for two reasons. So that we don't take credit ourselves and pat ourselves on the back and tell people how amazing we are and what God does with us, but that we would be humble and recognize it's only God. Uh, why he uses me, I don't know. If I were him, I wouldn't use me. But, but it's only God. And the second thing is to clarify, it's God that is pursuing and doing. It's not that loving person in front of you. It's not that great person who God used. It's God himself 
who is reaching out, speaking, touching, healing, working, leading. God, the creator of the universe, is the one that is doing it. Using us? Yes. But it's God who is doing it. It mentioned there in his quote that we are merely jars of clay filled with the power of God. That comes from 2 Corinthians 4, 7 that says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, jars of clay, that the excellence of the power of God may be of God and not of us. Did you catch that? We are these earthen vessels that the excellence of the power of God may be demonstrated that it's the power of God, not of us. But when I say that we are merely jars of clay, I don't want you to think that God looks at, at us as something of little or no value. There's, there's this misconception that, that to be humble means that you have to dislike yourself and hate yourself and be humble. To be humble means you just don't look at yourself as much. Okay, you pass by the mirror without turning your head more often. Okay, you, you don't look at yourself as much or at all. But it doesn't mean that you're nothing. It doesn't mean that you're worthless. To be humble means that you don't look to you. You look to God. So merely jars of clay, clay don't misunderstand. God loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son to die for us. I have one son. Okay? Um, not, anxious to, not anxious to give him up. Not. Okay? I mean, he's not mine. He's God's. And if God wants to take him, which I pray daily, he doesn't. But God gave, willingly gave up his son to die for our sins. Now that's love. That's what God thinks of you. Genesis tells us that we are created in the very image of God. The ways, the thoughts, the ideas, the, the passions, those are all part of God. He gave us, He gave us part of His passions and desires. These aren't things that we figured out and came up with and years of study said, you know what would be fun? No, we are made in the image of God. So love and affection and care and, and, and helpfulness and, and understanding, these are all characteristics of God that He, He loves us so much, has given us. The Bible says that we are children of God, and if we're children of God, then we're heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. Heirs meaning all that God has, we're heir to that. You guys have seen on television stuff, the heir to the such and such a million dollar corporation did this. Yeah, we're heirs to God. Okay? We have access to our Father's possessions. So, don't look at yourself and say, yeah, I'm merely a jar of clay. But, but I have the power of God in me. No, you're very special. God adores you. He adores you. So, yes, we are merely jars of clay that are filled with the excellence of the power of God so that the power of God may be of God and not of us. God doesn't want us to get mixed. So who did that? Well, you're just a vessel of clay, so obviously it came from him. He doesn't want any confusion. So God does his work through us, but not by our own power or godliness. God stirs up the spirits of people, not us. We don't stir up their spirits. We may, you know, feel that, by that. That comment of that may, I made to that person, it just, bam, it nailed them, you know, bam, right between the eyes, man. I mean, mm, that was a good word. But you didn't, I didn't stir their spirits. It was the Lord. 
God stirs up the spirits of people, not us. God may use us as instruments of permission, like I said, or wisdom or direction or encouragement. He may use the things that we have said. He may use the things that we have done. But He does the stirring because He's the one that truly, completely, and totally loves. So He's doing the work. That's why you can't make anybody accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Have you ever wanted to do that? I mean, it's like, and and you're thinking in your head, I mean, like, maybe if I slap them, maybe that'll wake them up. Or, you know, uh, maybe if I shake them, maybe that'll wake them up. And we're trying to figure out ways because they seem to be unmoved by these amazing things that we're sharing. And it's like, I don't understand that. It's because we don't have that authority and power. Okay? We have the authority to slap them upside the head, but if you do that, you're going to jail. Okay? And there's no glory to God. Um, So, it's because we have to recognize God may give us the words. I've been with people that have shared amazing... I've almost wanted to accept the Lord again. It was just like, wow, man, how do you walk away from that? How do you not embrace that? And they just go, ah, yeah, yeah, I'm happy for you, but I'm out of here. And it's like, what is wrong with them? Okay, and it didn't work. But did it? And I, I'm under the, uh, the conviction and belief that as they're walking away, they're wrestling. Like, well, that was good. I, don't, I didn't have an answer. That's why I had to hurry up and get out of there. They, they almost had me. Paul was preaching to a king, and, and the king told him, Yo, you almost had me, Paul. <sighs> but I pushed it down, and off I went, and I refused, and all right. And now, unfortunately, he's not with Jesus. So, it's the Spirit of God that does the work. The joy and the excitement of this is that it, it tells us that it's it's God loves these people that much. He keeps telling them and sending people. When I get the word that someone is in the hospital and, the, and, and they're, they're close to death and, and they've rejected Jesus and they've even been rude and harsh and mean to their family, I pray, my biggest prayer is, Lord, may the doctors, the nurses, the helpers, the cleaners, may they know Jesus and may they be around Him and may they share Jesus. Because trust me, If a nurse is about to give you a shot and tells you, did you know that Jesus loves you? You're not going to yell at her. All right? She's about to stick a needle in you. All right? So you'll be polite and patient and listen. As you're getting ready to roll into surgery to be cut open, and the doctor says, do you mind if I pray with you? You don't say, no, no, thank you. I don't want prayer. He's about to cut you open. All right? So you say, doc, you want to pray? You pray. Okay? And so I pray that God sends doctors and nurses into these individuals that they may once again, because I know they've heard it, once again, hear of the love of God and the sacrifice of Jesus that they may surrender to the Lord because He's the one that does the work. It is not us. Now, the second thing I'd like to focus on from this verse was the faithfulness of God. Now, In Leviticus chapter 25, the Lord had given the children of Israel the laws throughout Leviticus. One of the laws was that they were to plant their crops in the fields for six years straight. The seventh year, they were not to plant the crops. They were not to put anything into the ground. They were to give the ground rest. It was referred to as the Sabbath for the land. And then you read in Leviticus 26, the next chapter, that the Lord said that uh, if they do not honor nor keep the Sabbath for the land, that he would remove them from the land for the amount of Sabbaths that they owed. Well, from the time of their first king, King Saul, till they're taken into captivity was 490 years. Okay? And not one king, not one time, not one year did they ever honor the Sabbath year for the land. So seven into 490, they owed God 70 years of Sabbath for their land. 
Remember how long their captivity was? 70 years. In fact, we read in 2 Chronicles 36, 21, that they would remain in captivity until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath till full, till fulfi to fulfill 70 years. So God was faithful. Okay, now take a step back. You know the laws of God. You're planting your crops. Ugh, here comes that seventh year. You know, we're not supposed to plant. So what has he done for the last 65, seven-year periods that we've ignored? Nothing? Exactly. Don't worry about it. I know that God would prefer it, but he's not like all crazy about it, okay? Oh, no, he's faithful in his discipline. God is faithful to discipline those that are not listening and following. And, and listen, I know Hebrews tells us no one likes to be disciplined especially at the time of disciplining, but it teaches us. It's important for us to be, to be faithful and consistent in our discipline of our children so that they will not disrespect our word, so that they will learn to obey, so that they will learn to respect authority. Anyone who tells their boss to go jump in the lake doesn't understand authority until they're standing in the unemployment line. Then they get it. But when there's no discipline, then there's no growing. There's no understanding. There's no learning. There's no boundaries. There are people that actually want to be disciplined. That sounds weird, I know. But it's... it's it sets boundaries. It knows, it lets you know how far you can go. And, and laws and, and, and boundaries are set for protection. Okay, my grandkids are not allowed to go past the curb. Why? Cars will hit them. Okay, so don't go past the curb. And if they go past the curb, they're immediately dealt with. Not because they didn't obey, but because they need to learn there's a reason. And they're taught. God is faithful to discipline. We need to accept God's faithfulness to discipline us when we go wrong and when we go astray. We don't have to get, we, we, we shouldn't be mad at God. We should accept what he's done and what he's doing. Proverbs 3.11 says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects just as a father, the son in whom he delights. It's an act of love. Jesus tells us in Revelation 3.19, and as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. You know, and as many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. Why? Because he loves us. I've shared this, shared this story before that when I was in junior high, a friend and I cut class. He talked me into it. It wasn't my idea. <laughs> Now, we cut class, and we got busted, okay? And uh, so I was put on restriction, and uh, we were both kicked out of school. My parents both worked, so being the good kid that I was, even though I was on restriction and wasn't allowed to leave the house, my friend who lived across the street, I went to his house. This was before you had the ring. My parents had no idea I left. Uh, and so I went over there, and he's pacing in his room, and he's, he's agitated and angry. And, and I told him, wow, man, I got two weeks restriction. What happened to you? And he didn't answer me. And it's like, what are you so upset about? And he grabs this screwdriver, sticks it in his back pocket, and he goes, goes down the hallway. So I'm walking behind him, and he goes into his dad's room, his, who's laying in bed, and he tells his dad, why don't you love me? My dad, his dad says, oh, get out of here. And he goes, why don't you correct me? Why don't you punish me? Why don't you tell me what's wrong? He pulls out the screwdriver, and he says, if you don't restrict me, if you don't punish me, I'm going to stab you with this. And his dad says, oh, shut up and get out of here. And it hit me. In junior high, I learned this. It hit me. So discipline's an act of love. He doesn't think his dad cares. So cut school, I don't care. So get in trouble, what do I care? So go to jail, whatever, I don't care. Leave me alone. 
There's no love. And I got it. I got it in junior high, which in my world anyways, junior high, I was pretty brain dead. But I got that. God disciplines us because he loves us. And so he's faithful in his love. And since he's faithful in his love, he's faithful in his discipline. And the good news is that God is also faithful to his promises to restore. He had, re he had promised Israel that after seven years of discipline, he would restore them to the land. Jeremiah 29.10 says, For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. And we are reading in the book of Ezra that God has fulfilled that and he is in the process of returning them to their land. God has arranged this is the exciting thing, folks, is, is it's 70 years. And God is now arranging for them to return to Jerusalem. Why? Because he's faithful. He's faithful to do what he has said that he will do. God is faithful to his promise to restore and to cleanse us when we've sinned. He, he's faithful. He tells Israel that I will restore you. I will bring you back. I will open the door. I will stir the spirits. And he does all of that because he's faithful. And he's faithful to, to cleanse and forgive us of our sins when we mess up. 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's the Lord, folks. It is the Lord that leads us to repentance. It isn't like, oh, I finally got it. No, it's the Lord that leads us to this. But there's a very important part about God's faithfulness. We must be faithful to take the opportunities of God's faithfulness and to go through the doors that God opens to lead us to repentance. He's faithful to open the doors. We must be faithful to walk through those doors. To go towards His faithfulness, we need to be faithful towards Him. Remember, not everyone returned to Jerusalem. God will not force anyone to accept His grace or His ways. He won't force it. He will open doors and say, and invite you in and provide the means and the ways and everything else. But we have to be faithful to go through that door. The Lord will always be faithful to open the doors to return to Him. And He will always be faithful to forgive, cleanse, and accept you. But will you be faithful to follow Him through the door and return to Him? Because He's not going to grab you by the ear and drag you through. He says, there's the door. I've opened it for you. I've provided it for you. I've given you the strength to walk through it go. And our part is to go through that door. The last thing I'd like to go over today is how the Lord uses everybody. Look at our text again, Ezra chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. And all those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with precious things besides all that was willingly offered. King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and put in the temple of his gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, brought them out by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and counted them out um, to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. This is the number of them, 30 gold platters, 1,000 silver platters, 29 knives, 30 gold basins, 410 silver basins of similar kind, and 1,000 other articles. All the articles of gold and silver were 5,400. All these Sheshbazar took with the captives who were brought from Babylon to Jerusalem. Those that did not go, door was open, you can return to Jerusalem, you can live there, and you can help build the temple. Uh, I don't want to go. 
I believe the majority of them didn't want to go because their businesses were doing well. They had grown comfortable. Kids had friends. Um, you know, it's just, I, I'm comfortable here. I'm used to this now. But God doesn't stomp his foot and say, well, I'm fine. I'm just going to bless those that go. You guys can just stay here and I'll keep you miserable and sad until you finally do what I want you to No, no. God steers their heart in their spirit, and they give. They encouraged those that were going. There were about 50,000 that went. And, and he, they encouraged by, by supplying for them. They give silver, gold, material supplies. Cyrus even returns the articles from the house of the Lord. That Remember that the temple of God had a lot of gold and silver and articles and, and, and things in it. And, and Nebuchadnezzar took all that and put it in the temple of his gods. Well, Cyrus takes it out of the temples of, of Nebuchadnezzar's gods and gives it back to God. So you can definitely see that the Lord had stirred the spirit of Cyrus so that he willingly gave up a lot of gold and silver. Okay, which not many people give up a lot of gold and silver. Um, but he, his heart was stirred to that point. Listen, let me be simple and straightforward with you. God... God has chosen to build his church through giving. He has chosen to send people out through giving. It was not something that the church leadership came up with. It was not something that the missionary council came up with. It was not something that the church board came up with. It was not something that the pastors came up with. God has chosen to build his church through people giving. God has chosen to send people out through giving. Okay? God's call. God's choice. Has that been abused? Oh, yeah. Anything God gives us, we abuse. Notice as the Lord did not force anyone to go to Jerusalem, those that went were willing to go. Same thing with the giving. They were, it says there that they all, all that they were willing to offer. It wasn't like, you know, Cyrus gave them a, a, a message, a, an encouragement, or, or Sheshbazar said, listen, man, we, we don't have enough money. We really need you guys. You know, I mean, we passed the bucket once. I took a look at it. Yeah, you can do better than that. Come on, man. You need to dig deeper. You need to go further. You need to give more. No. They gave willingly. Okay, now the only way people will willingly give their stuff is if God stirs their spirit. Okay? And so they willingly did this. When the children of Israel were going to build the tabernacle, God had laid out the blueprints, and there was a lot of gold involved, you guys. There was a lot of bronze involved. There was a lot of silver involved. And, and so. How are they going to do this? We read in Exodus 35, 5, it says, Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as an offering to the Lord. Gold, silver, and bronze. This isn't a Moses tabernacle. This isn't a Moses thing. This is an Israel thing. Everybody gets to be involved. So Moses, take an offering. And again, Moses didn't count it and say, you can do better than this. We're going to go with round two here, and, and I need you to dig deep. He says, whoever is of a willing heart. And again, to have a willing heart to give up your gold, silver, and bronze comes from God. The Lord wants us to be cheerful in giving. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Oh, I have to give. Or, you know, you, 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 have, you, you, you give money and there's little corners broken to where they, they won't let go and you finally tear it and they, they're holding the little corner because I didn't really want to let it. He says, listen, that's not what it's about. Here's the deal, folks. I will never, I will never pressure you or plead with you to give. 
I will and I have told you that the Lord teaches us that we are to give. I just share with you that God has chosen to do the work in His church and through His church through giving. But it is the Lord who must stir your spirit to give, not me. You're not going to hear me give some lecture. You're not going to hear me, you know, go through. I even know of churches who have brought in special speakers to give a special message on giving. Because in the pastor's opinion, the church wasn't giving enough. So he didn't want to do it. So this guy, this is one of his expert fields. He goes around from churches and rebukes churches for not giving enough. And I just can't find it biblically. I just know where can I find where, where anybody begged for money or pleaded or scolded or embarrassed or challenged. I've even heard of churches that if you write a check and it bounces, they post your name and your check on a bulletin board in the foyer so the rest of the church can see. Mm, do you see that? That's a healthy, good-looking check, but it bounced. Really? So you won't have to ever worry about me pressuring you. I have had people say, you know, Pastor, I know your heart and I know everything, but you need to be a little more importance of giving, okay? Um, hey, no. All I do is open the Word and teach, yes, this is how God accomplished His work. But He stirs the heart, not me. So as your pastor, I will always share the instructions of the Word and, and the truth of the Word, but I will not enforce you or beg you or plead with you or, or pressure you in any way to give because that's between you and God. Your giving is between you and the Lord. Okay, I have nothing to do with it. it it's, it's between you and the Lord. Um, all right. I always hate when God brings me to those parts of scriptures where I have to talk about giving, but we made it, so let's wrap it up. Listen, folks, God loves you so much. He enjoys, listen to this, He enjoys working with you in His work. I love it when my grandson works with me, even though it adds another half hour to my chore, okay, because he's with me. Years ago, my son and I went back uh, to Green Bay to visit my parents, and, and they wanted a ceiling fan replaced, and and so I, I, I got a picture of it. It's my son and I working on the fan together. I love it when my family and my, my loved ones and my friends work with me. I need you to understand this, folks. God enjoys working with you in His work. He loves stirring our spirits to do His will and His purpose as He continues to reach out to a fallen and struggling world. He loves it when we work with Him and we follow Him and we listen to Him. He will absolutely discipline it, us when we need it because He absolutely loves us and He wants us to grow and understand. He will always be faithful after every lost and fallen lamb he goes after them and brings them back. He will. He is faithful to do that. God is faithful to come after every lost and fallen lamb and bring them back to safety. There's a picture of a shepherd or Jesus carrying a lamb around his neck. And when I think of that scripture, his faithfulness in going after those that are lost or fallen, that's why I see him carrying us back to the fold. He loves watching us work together. He does. He loves watching us encourage one another. This isn't mandates. This isn't requirements. This isn't so that we can get, get you know, points because we're doing more for God. This is encouraging each other. This is helping one another. This is working with God to accomplish God's will and God's purpose. He loves it. He loves it. And it may take more than an extra half hour because He is using us. 
but he loves it. He loves that we want to and we are and we come alongside, whether it be through doing something or giving something or saying something or looking a particular way or, or looking at somebody or smiling at somebody. He loves it when we work with him in doing and do, accomplishing his work. Listen, I, I pray that we will all walk with him each day. I pray that we will read his word and pray and listen to him as he stirs our very spirit day by day. Father, thank you for bringing us together today, Lord, and we pray that you would bless this time as we worship you, Lord. Lord, that we would focus upon you, Lord, and realize how you love us. You look down upon each and every one of us, and you've got this awesome smile as you love us and you care for us and you work in us and through us. You love it when we come alongside you and say, Father, well, how can I help? What do you, what do you want me to do? You love it, Father, when we attempt to do things that we're not quite capable of and, and you love coming alongside us and go, here, let me do that for you. Let me help. Father, you love working with us. You love working through us. And so, Father, I pray that as we worship you now, Lord, that we will just look at you and just adore you for who you are. Be thankful for your faithfulness. Be thankful for your love for us. Bless our time of worship, Lord. Bless our offering as we give it unto you. And, Lord, prepare our heart for communion as we take the time to remember the amazing life we have is because of the suffering of Christ. Bless our time of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship.